Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of The Daily Sib. I'm really uh, excited to chat with my good friend, Lynn. Lynn, where, where are you calling in from, by the way? I'm coming in from Wimbledon, uh, South West Wimbledon, South London. London. Yeah, cool. Well, I thank you for coming on the show, first and foremost. Well, thank you for inviting me, and it's it's a pleasure to uh, have a chat with you and you know cover a few points. Definitely, yeah. We've obviously got a bit of a plan in mind of where we're going to take the conversation, but everybody watching, you know, as always, feel free to share your thoughts and, and questions as we go through, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on the incoming uh, messages. Um, another thing to mention is that Lynn and I do know each other, so obviously there's been some guests that I haven't really met until the actual interview itself, whereas um, Lynn and I have been working together with Open Inclusion for sort of, I think it's four or five years now, Lynn, is it? Uh, it must be, yeah. I think uh, you joined about a year into our conception of having panel leads for um, people with different needs. And I think you virtually the last baby time group of six people and we cover and oh, Liz. Um, sorry Lynn Lynn we're, we're losing you a yeah. little bit can you can you hear me help people within those communities and yes yeah I think you it, losing me? it's um it's caught back up again um it, it went a bit sort of Martin. robotic and delayed and everything um yeah, I think we're I think we're back. Um, I think you were just saying that it was around the year after Open Inclusion had started, and um, the the fact that they have the panel and they help connect disabled consumers with businesses for inclusive design, and we're we're panel leads, so we represent subsections of the disability community on mobility and dexterity, and you you manage the the visual impairment side, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And I think that the connection seems to have settled a little bit. So we we'll, we should be right to crack on and I'll, I'll yell if we get any glitches again anyway. Um so yeah, it'd be great next up if you could just Well, let, wait, let me know. If we do... Yeah, I will let you know. Say, let me know if there are any glitches. But if it I can probably get children off off um off the internet and try and get more stable internet connection this end okay okay there, there's a little bit of a delay which we can deal with i think but um yeah if it gets worse i, I will let you know but yeah can, can you just give a bit of a an intro to, to you and your background please lynn yes um well, as you said, I'm visually impaired. I've got a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. Which meant my sight wasn't too bad growing up. And uh... No, sorry, Lynn. Lynn, it's totally, it's it's gone again. The, um, the video is frozen and the sound is very, very glitchy. I have now. I've had almost all the stages, you know, how to retreat to getting a guide dog when I was 20, first guide dog. I've now had four guide dogs. So I had very little education in my brain there. <laughs> I never realised until that point. Um, so they introduced me to um, mathematics and geography. Art were my A-levels. I loved all of them. Uh, so the career was maths and computing. So subsequently I did um, maths and computing, got a first class degree and thought, I don't want to spend my life doing this. <laughs> so I then retrained as an artist. So I'm a visual artist. I got a BA in the MA in fine art. I 
love because I can use it a way to become more to discuss issues, you know, to discuss issues about accessibility, about inclusion. And I feel as if I'm making an impression on the world. Whereas working for a computer company, coding some code for some, you know, big American company, it wasn't satisfying. I'm probably like working I and about, I like doing different things. Obviously, making a career as an artist is really, really tough. So I also then became an equalities trainer, specialising in audio description, touch training, general equalities, mainly around the arts. And I've also trained a coach. So I'm a, a coach, a life coach, career coach. And again, the communities I mainly work with are artists and disabled people. Great. Can, can you hear me all right, Lynn? Oh, it's a really not a great connection. Can can you hear me there, Lynn? No, let me um let me appear to shop for a second. Okay, I'm gonna take Lynn off of the the stream. So maybe Lynn can have a look um if there's a way of getting the internet connection a little bit stronger. Um so I'll do a little bit of a filler. Um, while well, Lynn maybe addresses that internet issue um, and we'll, we'll see what happens. The the beauty of live streaming and when technology doesn't work, I can see Lynn has gone. Um, the way this tech here works is there's sort of a green room, so to speak. So um, I can still see on my dashboard that Lynn has, has gone off camera. So at least um, she's heard the, the thing about trying to get the internet sorted. I think she said the kids are on are on it at the moment, so it might be the, the reason. Let's give it another go. No worries, no worries. Can, can you hear me now, Lynn? Yeah. Cool. Um, I can it, now, yes. Good. It, it seems a, a bit better. It was very glitchy, but like, because a couple of people have been writing that they, they couldn't really hear. I mean, I think you talked about sort of having a vision impairment, and having guide dogs. And I just want to sort of very quickly summarize what I know you were going through. You then talked about your studies and working in um, a business with computers, but eventually transitioned out of working in a more corporate computer world into um, sort of coaching and art and inclusion. Is, is that a fair sort of potted summary of what you were talking about? No, I think it's cut out again, Lynn. Oh, it's so frustrating. <laughs> no, we're having a bit of a a tech nightmare today. Um, Lynn, if you can hear, just um, I'm gonna I've taken you off, so maybe take a couple of minutes just to re like come out and come back in again, on and just sort of see if you can get the the tech to behave and the internet connection to work a little bit more um but in the meantime so yeah as I tried to just summarize from Lynn's uh summary very much a sort of story of the the barriers of living with vision impairment and how a guide dog was a really big part of being able to to overcome certain barriers in society and to enable her to be independent um I, can't, I think she said she'd studied computer science, but I certainly know that she worked in the world of computers, but decided she wanted to get out of that and move more into coaching and art and inclusion. And as she was saying at the very beginning, we've both been involved with Open Inclusion, who I sort of summarised about five minutes ago, what they do and how we've had an involvement in them. So that's how I know Lynn. Um, so I was going to, yeah, she, she's gone, she's logged out. So Hopefully when she logs back in, we might have a bit more luck second time round or third time round. Um, and yeah, I mean, for me, I'm just going to be quite excited and keen to to chat to Lynn a bit more about generally what, what life is like with a visual impairment. Um, I, I think, you know, being a wheelchair user, that's my lived experience that I always want to raise 
awareness because a lot of society doesn't really understand what it truly is like to, to be in a wheelchair. But also I think that when we think about disability, a lot of people do think of wheelchair users and I think it's really important to raise awareness of hidden disabilities and not, and not just hidden but even other visible disabilities but that aren't just somebody that uses a wheelchair so I'm quite um you know if we can get this back on track keen to hear a bit more from Lynn about that um obviously around the the coaching and consultancy it's something I've done a lot of and that's what you know Lynn and I do for open inclusion but I was looking forward to hearing a bit about some of that but more so her art background I know she uses her art in some of her coaching as well but how we yeah how her art came about and what kind of art she's doing that was another area that if we get back into it we can explore with Lynn um but also the you know there's been some guests I've spoke to that have not there's not been so much more around COVID-19 to mention or maybe more so they only had sort of very similar experiences to what we've covered in past episodes. So it was better to go more into their history and their future plans and just touch upon where they're at with COVID-19. Whereas with Lynn, I think um, there's a lot of things going on for her right now because of lockdown and because of COVID-19 that are very, very challenging for her. Um, she was saying to me before we went live, that I think, I think from what I understood, her partner has a visual impairment as well. And they're looking at how they can get out and start running again because they, they enjoy uh, running and, and exercising. Obviously, we all need to do exercise. It sounds like they quite enjoy doing exercise too. Um, but how difficult that is in terms of where they can safely run and, and have the social distance. So I've seen Lynn has come back up now. Hello, Lynn. Hi, sorry. <laughs> I hope this is going to be more successful. Yeah, we'll um we'll give it a go. I've just been sort of filling in the the kind of bits I wanted to ask you and the the experiences that I know that you're going to be able to share. You sort of framed it a bit more. I think if it does die again, we'll maybe have to have to leave it. But at the moment, we seem to be to be okay. So, um, could you just chat a bit more about the the art side of life, that how you got into art and what, what you're doing now and what it means to you? Yeah, um, well, after I finished the maths and computing degree and did an arts degree instead, I, as I said, uh, which you might not have caught, uh, the main reason was to do art was that I wanted a social impact. I wanted to talk about accessibility. I wanted to talk about inclusion. And by studying maths and computing, the only thought, thing I thought I could do was make some rich American computer company even richer, uh, which wasn't one of my main goals in life. So uh, I was lucky enough, Guide Dogs at that time helped me pay for my arts degree. Um, mm -hmm. And all the way through, my art was slightly different. So um, I studied at Wimbledon School of Art. Okay. And that was really, really tough on me. Uh, <laughs> they were tough on any art student, but I think the head of the department just didn't get why I was making art and what was it about. And the, it's for me, it's, uh, it, it's often about inclusion but it's also often about being a bit over the top a bit tongue in cheek i actually follow a arts group called the situationists right and basically in the 1950s a load of french mainly guys used to go around different pubs getting drunk <laughs> and they would um they would um connect places by the atmosphere so, uh, so you look. You don't look at geographical connections. You look at atmospheric connections, the ambiance of places. What mm. they also they did was they they play. So they play about with art. So they they drew maps and changed them. But they, they you know they did fun things. And I think a lot of my art has got got to do with that. Uh, but it's also important to me that it's inclusive. So it doesn't have to be completely inclusive for everyone to be able to appreciate on the same level. But there has to be something for someone to agree. So I've got an artwork called 202020, a psychogeographer's tale. And that, that's actually on YouTube on my channel. 
and it's what's your channel name? Uh, not sure right now straight, straight off <laughs> um it'll be lynn cox the, the, um you can definitely get to it from my instagram as well which is link lynn.cox underscore art underscore underscore run because <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're my friends. and uh it, it shows 20 images and connected with each one it's juxtaposed with 20 sounds and it shows about oh nearly 20 years of my arts career in six six forty. Mm -hmm. So it's called it's a quite on a technique called petticulture. Where sighted art uh they would just generally show 20 images and talk over them and say what the images oh yeah are. I've done a petticulture so talk I yeah 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 sure there was Yeah, so it was based on that, and we were looking at how to make it accessible. But the thing is, the the sound of the images don't necessarily make make sense. So I do wire sculptures that can be felt and touched, and I draw with rope uh, on the wall, or I might draw with wool in paper. So I'm very much mm. a line drawer. Yeah. Actually, if people go to my website, they'll see some of my work. It's um www arts coaching training dot com because they're the three areas I work in arts okay. coaching and training um yeah. but it's all from an inclusive point of view. Brilliant. I, I, I it's really interesting sort of um you know there's the sensory side like you said about the wall or the, the rope and the, the ways of drawing using those kind of materials but also you mentioned the ambience of a place is is art as well and that's yeah really Really, a fascinating way of, of approaching it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for me, I, I, it it's a different. The, the vision is important, and it's important how my artworks look visually, because so many people are still in, interested in the visual first. Actually, an awful lot of my artwork at a deeper level to for what they're about yeah is it the texture of a piece of um, glass wall so i took a, a print of a glass wall and cast it in this beautiful blue glass and you've got all the intricacies of an old-fashioned glass wall and you can feel it and, and the delicacy of it is wonderful um then you uh, or in a, ready to jump that's ropes and I was absolutely both the same time you know, was the perfect you stood so it's all about vision because it's assumed I think you know a lot of a lot of people can't see I can't see now but I went through all those stages of seeing quite wellish <laughs> to nothing and actually you can play about with vision so much but also I want it to work on a tactile level for those that can't see at all or i want uh, an audio recording um to a visual so somebody can at least appreciate the aud audio and often it's audio described as well or i'll do transcripts so if it's a visual piece and there's audio on it i'll do a transcript for deaf people uh i haven't got as far as bsl in them yet <laughs> uh, <laughs> but equally you know if it's um an audio piece uh, uh, if it's a visual I, I will describe it um, if it is purely a visual please uh, you can understand a lot of it from the soundtrack of the video if it needs extra I'll, I'll do I think it's the poorest level for me it's that you've still got to be true to what the artwork is meant to be but then adding the extras to make it accessible for everyone or as many as you can. It's impossible to do everyone. Yeah. Okay. Just to let you know, Liam, we did have a couple of little breaks in there. I think we, we got the, the the gist of what you were saying. I'm just a bit wary. We might lose you again. So, I mean, can you, yeah. if you could chat around a bit, we were talking about COVID-19 and, you know, some of the specific challenges and maybe a couple of the solutions. Yeah. I think if we could get 
get that out. We might have to we might have to think about wrapping up afterwards. So yeah. Okay, it's interesting the COVID okay, because well, there's been two aspects to it. There's been the lockdown and the lockdown for me hasn't been terribly diff different because yes I do work out of the house um, I go places I do training I um, I do people in workshops um, and exhibitions in the dark so I travel all over the world doing that so I do travel but also a lot of the time I am based at home so for me actually being in wasn't that bad because all I've done is concentrate well more on making my artworks I am doing um, a series of pieces called Two Meters, <laughs> original title. Uh, <laughs> but it's all about this two meters because if you're visually impaired, how the hell can you judge two meters? <laughs> you know, and somebody said, oh, it's the same as an elk. You know, it's the same as two trolleys, uh, shopping trolleys. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, if the person likes a little bit more, if they and all these to me is really frustrating. Um, Lynn, I don't know if you can hear me, but it, it's cut out again. It's you know, let me bring you back. It's really, it's really gone very glitchy again. Okay. God, I th carry on one more oh, time, and I think. Um, do you want me to try and come in again? Yeah, t t try it, and I think if if it cuts out, we're gonna have to call it a day, though. No, uh, I'm loath. I'm loath to end it, but um, yeah, it's really not working very well today. It seems like maybe the the connection, the internet, at Lynn's side is, is struggling a little bit. Um, what shall we do, people? <laughs> it's a really a shame because I know Lynn has got so many cool things to talk about. Um, she was explaining just now that being she does work at home a lot, so the lockdown has meant that you know some respects it's been similar and not too difficult um but yeah obviously like judging two meters as someone with a visual impairment is is very difficult and that's you know that's what she was starting to to raise awareness about those difficulties and uh i think what, what we maybe have to do is get lynn um i might see if she's able to do like a video recording or a, a written article mark saying ask her back on my, my, the worry and the risk is that we're going to have the same problem with the internet connection her end. But if there's a way that she knows it's not going to break, absolutely we'll get her back on. If not, um, it might be on Disability Horizons. Um, we can get an article or a video from Lynn to, to finish off what she was saying. Um, yeah, no, it's a real shame. I, I really like Lynn as a person. We've had a lot of giggles when we've worked for open inclusion and um, we had one of those moments we were in a lift, there was myself in the wheelchair, Lynn with a visual impairment and Ed who's deaf and has a BSL interpreter. And we were all trying to work out how to get a poo bag for Lynn's guide dog because he needed to, to, take a, to take a poo, have a poo. Um, so yeah, it was just quite, quite interesting how we all had our superpowers and our limitations with our different disabilities and how we all managed to solve the, the issue of the, the poo bag for the guide dog. Um, so yeah, well, I'll, I'll try to find a way of getting Lynn's uh, story and tips and advice and awareness out there in a different way. As Mark said, maybe get her back on if we can sort out the tech side. Um, but yeah, but I'm sorry about that guys. Obviously when tech fails, it fails epically. Um, and um, yeah, we'll get Lynn on again. Um, for me, there's not really a lot I'm going to add in terms of the topic. It's not something I've got 
lived experience of. Um, but I think we still got some things from Lynn, which was really interesting to to hear about. Um, what Paul said, should I ask? Question mark. What what should you ask? Let me know, Paul. I'm not sure what you want to ask. <laughs> um, the good news, by the way, is that I'm now getting the comments coming through from LinkedIn. So Don, I brought it up already earlier, but is on LinkedIn saying, well done, both of you. Um, so I don't have to have to look down at my phone to check things coming in from LinkedIn. So the last bit of the puzzle, if you're watching StreamYard, is the software and Instagram is like I'm not able to live stream to Instagram live and it would be awesome to hit all the platforms because I've got a bit of a following on Instagram but it's a bit difficult to well it's impossible to use the software to do it um, but we are going as I mentioned a few times to Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube and Twitch there's like five channels ah Paul saying how you solved how you solve the lift situation. Well, let's see if um, Lynn has come back in again. Let's see if we're going to get this to work. But we are going to have to call it a day if it fails. Hello, Lynn. Yeah. Hello. Hi. So Sorry I've done a bit that. of a... Now... <laughs> Sorry, go on, Lynn. I was just saying I'm now mobile data, so hopefully this will work. Okay, cool. So my, my bit of a filler was a slight summary of what you sort of said, but it was also just how we've had quite a, a few giggles in the past and I was really looking forward to like getting a few more insights from you for the audience. And I was telling the, the story of when your guide dog needed a poo bag and there was me, you and Ed with Tony, his BSL interpreter, and we were trying to find the, the answer to the situation, right? Yeah. <laughs> It was sort of like we yeah. had we had our superpowers and our limitations with our disabilities. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So Paul, powerful... Go on, go on then. I was just going to say it's quite a powerful group, the open inclusion group, because yeah. uh, you know uh, we're all six very different personalities, um, yeah. but very passionate about what we do. You know. Yeah, no, it's very um, true. It's been very. I mean, I I've learned a lot about other impairments because I mean, I've you know I've been at schools with people students with different disabilities, and I've done a lot of work in the disability world. But like because we all get together often, and that's the whole point is to share our our insights. Is like, yeah, I've learned so much about the different impairments that are represented. Well, it was fascinating. One of the um, insights I, I had, um, Ed, who is a deaf um, participant, who is a yeah. BSL inter um, language user, but he also reads lips. And obviously with the masks coming in, that mm. stops communication and his understanding, whether it is BSL or, or reading lips. And I came back to him saying well actually as a visually impaired person because you don't always hear people properly I mean my hearing is perfectly fine and it's been tested but I don't always hear people properly and I fill it up because I haven't got the visual gestures mm. so if I've got the muffled voice well that's going to become an issue yeah. uh, even though our, our conditions are very different we're, we're going to have similar similar issues I yeah. don't have people coming towards me because I can't hear them normally I'd come go towards somebody if I couldn't hear them I can't do that so yeah um, and that's back actually, to your point it's going to be back to you sorry there was back to your point before about your struggles with knowing what two meters is right yeah it is because this two meters is a nightmare I mean I, as I say I mean in isolation I haven't been out yet but I want to start running with my friend or, well my partner which will be fine because we've worked out where we can drive to a field, we can avoid people. So, you know, that might be the only time I can go out because how do you tell two metres? How do you tell two metres on a platform? How do you tell two metres in the shop? I'm the, the, There's no way you can stop somebody coming towards you if they're coming towards you because you can't tell, you can't necessarily hear their their feet you know um, mm. you know i can't teach the dog suddenly he's a guide dog i can't 
him to judge what two meters is and that yeah. to go closer. Um, normally, I'd book people to ask, you know, even shopping in, in a supermarket, you'd normally have somebody to go around with you and help you. So I think there's going to be a whole lot of people that are going to be actually more isolated when we come out of the lockdown mm. that are, than are now what isolating because actually at the minute the government's telling me to do this that's fine do you know what i mean i'm not going out but actually everybody else is going to start to be going out and i'm going to think ah i'm stuck in the house um because you know i've got children uh and they're still younger so if i'm ill that impacts you know them so you know i'm more worried i think on their behalf um you know, and I have asthma as well, so I have to be slightly more careful. Um, but I'm not yeah. on the vulnerable list, and that's been another great thing the vulnerable <laughs> list and shopping. You know, I just mentioned it briefly, but visually impaired people are not on the vulnerable list, and mm. in some ways, rightly so. You know, we haven't got the, the same issues, however, we've, we've got this issue about how do we go shopping? Who helps us? Um, how can we order it? We couldn't get on to any of, the, um, you know, uh, any of the supermarkets lists initially because we weren't classed as vulnerable. Now I've been fine because I've shopped online with a company for thirteen years since my youngest daughter was born, and I was put on their priority list because of that, because of loyalty. But disabled people can't get onto the loyalty lists. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's just coincidence that I've got on it. So I'm really aware of a lot. A lot of the issues out there that people have having, a lot of them have been resolved to lesser or greater <laughs> successes. Um, but there's still an awful lot of people out there that are going to find, actually, I think the post-lockdown harder than the lockdown. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's saying about what two metres is, I remember they kept talking about if you put your arm out and you're holding a, a broom, that's roughly two metres, but if you go around doing that, you're going to probably end up smearing someone with, with the broom. So that's probably not the best solution <laughs> for you. But, I mean, I, I was reading a, a no. book earlier on that um, I think her name's Cheryl Sandberg, and it's around women in the workplace and sort of it's more, much more about women's rights and inclusion of women, particularly at leadership and business level. But a lot of what she's talking about resonates with disability because there's this chicken and egg that some are saying oh you know you, you, the world has to be more inclusive so that disabled people can flourish but it also feels like you need disabled people to be more leaders and more achieving for society to take note and make those structural systemic changes and I, I think her point is you sort of need both you know you, you kind of need the political policy change in businesses and government and you need people that are demanding that change and pushing for that change in it in their everyday life and I mean sometimes solutions come with an individual just finding a bit of software or hardware to overcome barriers but like what you're talking about with the government vulnerable list and the shopping situation that that is a bigger picture policy systemic change that has to be made and it have you got any thoughts on how sort of activism can achieve its goals in the current climate oh sorry I didn't quite catch the end of that yeah it was just just around your thoughts on how activism, you know, in the current climate, is it possible for disabled people to get government and supermarkets to make these changes that are desperately needed? I, I think it's, re it's, it's really tricky because there's so many voices. You know, there's people that are losing their jobs, people that are on furlough. Will they go on furlough? Will they go redundant? It's almost, I feel, as if the requirements of disabled people in some ways uh, uh, you know, rights have been lost all over the world mm. um, that, that we've taken yet uh, in some ways you know 
uh, things are accessible and uh, or some things are accessible but actually trying to get your voice heard with everybody else trying to get their voices heard i think is going to be really tricky uh, accessibility to a certain degree i think has improved like platforms like zoom seem to be quite accessible uh, mm. but then you find other apps and the trouble is if the only way you've got to do something is online and you can't get online you know we're the privileged ones we can get online but there's a whole load of disabled people out there that haven't got the solutions we've got that have got the isolation have got no voice you know braille's not being um produced and, and sent out you know so people aren't getting um their books you know the rnib have done a, a technological solution for that but some people might not be happy with that one you know um there's there's no there's so many voices i think we're just going to lose a lot a lot of the disabled voices i think it's really important to tell people if something doesn't work you know one of the apps i'm using for exercise is really it works but you you elements of it are really inaccessible and all it is is they haven't labeled graphics mm. there are buttons so if they've labeled them which is like a 10 minute job it would have been accessible everyone um so i can use it with my daughter because she can press the buttons i need to press but a visually impaired person person by themselves wouldn't you know i can email them and say you know this isn't working they'll be on max saying sorry and do nothing you know how do you get your voice heard in these times yeah i mean it it, it seems like there are some businesses and maybe I don't know if, if there are particularly better instances with tech businesses or not, but, you know, the, the more businesses catch on to the spending power of disabled people, there's a reason for them to make those adjustments and amendments because they're going to end up with more happier, you know, included customers, and that means more profit. I think that the thing that worries me when there's a governmental policy perspective is like Jane Campbell was saying that, that there is still a need for protest and get you know going into like mass gatherings because for all the voice and the noise we have online, it sort of gets a bit lost online as well. But how are disabled people meant to go to an event and protest when we're not meant to leave the house because we're under the vulnerable list or like you're saying, you know, you can't adhere to social distancing. So it, there are some, for me, there's more worries around the government policy side, whereas I think businesses are more open to adjustments and amendments. Yeah, I agree, because they can see the business case for it. And actually, I think we, over the last years, we are making use with business. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention um, the shopping one I use, um, but they've been a, a brilliant. I, I managed to get myself into a, a dead end and couldn't use their site to check out the other day. So I I did a, a message to them. The next day they rang back. She went through it. She, she did the um, finished the order for me, asked what the issues were, rang back the week after, said, are you still having the same issues? Oh, well, wow. I didn't get into that situation. Um, but but they were making the effort to make it accessible. Do mm. you know what I mean? And I think the same with, um, it's, it's often the, the quality stores as well, which unfortunately means we sometimes pay a bit more for our products and but they seem to realise the worth, and actually, it's 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 the disabled, but it's it's the disabled and and the elderly. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Because if they're hitting us, they're hitting an awful lot of elderly people too, and the combined uh, income. You know, we we only use certain places because I've got access to them. So yeah. you know, when we're out and about, I love going to pizza place because they do a braille menu however they've just changed that to an iPad menu. Uh, i'm thinking well like <laughs> do you know sometimes 
lingering over a menu and, and feeling the, the list under your fingers. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, so some of the technology works, but some of the things I think, oh, I wish we could go back as well. Yeah, a lot, lot to change, certainly a lot to change. We're, we're getting another couple of little glitches, Lynn. So I think let, let's start to, to wrap up now. I mean, what for you, what, what sort of, um, obviously you've got to navigate lockdown and then coming out of lockdown and the challenges you've talked about but just sort of generally what what projects and plans have you got in the pipeline going forward uh going forward because i've done a lot of art whilst i've been in um the lockdown that i'm helping kids with their homework and working yeah. and doing everything else and god that we got food um <laughs> Uh, but a huge portion of it is um, is trying to get some get some exhibitions. As I say, I'm doing a whole load of work around the two meters, including a two meter circle made of copper wire, interlaced copper wire, oh. um, two meter batons, hammers, um, things like that. Um, a whole load of different materials and different objects, all all quite big, unfortunately, because of the two meters and um, so I'm looking for exhibitions exhibitions for that and I'm applying for some exhibitions and hopefully I'll have some of those photographable because uh, I'm still making them and a lot of them take hours and hours to make. Uh, so I should have photographs for them later in the year um, mm. as a selection and I'll have to set them up in the garden or on the driveway and um, I'll, I'll get some work that way. Also, I'm doing some inclusion work still, as there are places that still need inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, but another thing, you know, there's been a huge issue for me that the, the lockdown is um, my computer. Well, I'm actually on the phone now, but I've had issues with my computer and the keyboard not working. So you can't get anybody in. I can't take it to the Apple store to get it. Oh, God. Out. So um, that. That has been a huge, huge issue. Um, so, so it means um, my um, the things I've been writing and, and trying to do um, with writing jobs has gone down because I'm spending hours a day trying to fix this blooming issue. And I actually had it working on Monday for about three hours and it went again. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I'm taking notes. I'm, I'm doing a diary as well. So I'm hoping to do something that's a collage diary. Um, an artwork as well and I can put that on my website and other people's websites so I suppose it's more at the minute consolidating myself as an artist rather yeah. than a trainer and a coach and I could do the online coaching and I do enjoy with that but I think people need the help probably more when they're coming out when there's the uncertainties what do they do next you know an awful lot of what I do is career coaching mm. life coaching getting that balance right well the balance now there's the adjustment now and we're just coming into the bit where I think my coaching will apply more than when we've got the complete lockdown because I think people was just so, some were so shocked or some it's more than, more than norm. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. I think this next time, so I'll, I'll also look, be, look at doing some one-to-one -one coaching. There's an awful lot of trainers out there at the minute and I, I do do resilient as well as disability training. And uh, I do the training in complete darkness, which is really powerful because that really tells you about unusual circumstances, so putting people into a completely dark space and getting them to do tasks or getting them to reassess or create things in the dark. You often get to more the metaphorical level of people's issues. Mm. And actually, if you can work on that level with people as a coach, that's far, far deeper than almost working as a coach mentor, giving help and instructions. So because what's right for me isn't right for you and won't be right for the people listening. Yeah. So we've all got our own solutions that help ourselves. So if you can get to somebody's metaphorical language within their own minds, how they work and help them to find a solution, that's that's what I'm good at. Um, practical solutions a mentor can help you with. Do you know what I mean? It, yeah. Th this is the time I think when we're going to reassess in. I'm, I'm going to be more of an artist. 
um, I think. Um, I'm probably concentrating a bit more on the coaching and the training in the dark. So that means I'll I'll drop maybe some more of the equalities training because there's lots of equalities trainers there. And I'll specialise, I think, in the areas where I know I can give insight. Brilliant. Well, Lynn, we, we've, we've managed to get there. I think we've actually ended up getting a, a really good insight into your your story and um, what you're up to and some of the it was really important actually for you to help raise awareness for the the visually impaired community in general and of some of the issues at the moment as well um so thank you for for all of your wisdom and insights and for coming on today and, uh, and for bearing with the technology as well yeah sorry about that i think there's something gone wrong my end because i'm on I'm on mobile data and it's still a bit crackly, so I don't yeah, know no what happens. So it, it might, I don't know, but it might be if you're on a phone, it might not have the power that a laptop would have to sort of process it possibly. I don't know. But anyway, we, we got there. We, we had a good, a good chin wag oh, and lots of good, yeah. good outcomes. We'll it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, yeah. Thanks again, Lynn. I look forward to, well, I'll see you yeah. on I'll see you tomorrow morning. Say that again, Lynn. Yes, you will. You will. Uh, open. Open panel meeting. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Good Thank stuff. you very well, much. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And we'll see you again tomorrow Cheers. for the next episode. Bye-bye.